Okay, now I'm gonna hit you guys with some really, really big, big picture ideas and some big time commentary on our economic history. Um, from 1865, when the slave, you know, end of the Civil War, all the way through till 1945, the, uh, all the way till 1970, with with the, the Great Depression obviously being one of the exceptions during this period. Um, from 1865 to 1970, the U.S. economy grew at an insane clip, particularly post-World War II uh, from 1945 to 1970. We had insane growth during those years. And um, from 1940 to 1960, the uh, poverty rate in the black community went from 87% to 47% during this insane economic boom. So, or during a part of this insane economic boom from 1945 to 1970. Um, and right around 1970, uh, a decision was made by the people that actually run our country, or that were in charge of the politicians at the time, to change the fundamental goal of the U.S. economy and U.S. policy making from growing the domestic economy as much as possible to growing the global economy as much as possible. And those two, those two individual goals mean giant differences when it comes to policy, huge differences when it comes to policy. The, the main crooks of, of this change in, in sort of goals and, and policy making, um, or at least one of the main effects of it, was majorly diluting the value of labor through systemic macroeconomic policy. So certain policies exist outside of um, redistribution of wealth that do affect the natural distribution of wealth that laborers get when um, they're working in the marketplace. Oh, and I'll just throw this point in there now. Um, labor scarcity does not get achieved for a very long period of time as an economy grows because you're starting off with a huge labor supply and virtually zero jobs. So it takes a long time for those jobs to accumulate to the point where there's any labor scarcity and wages really, really grow um, fast. <clears throat> and so in this vein, the US policy making was designed to screw the American laborer and American laborers were sold out in 1970 because of this change in goals. Now, this took place for a variety of reasons. Um, sorry. This took place uh, through a variety of mechanisms. Sorry, that's what I meant to say. Um, inflation does it in two different ways. Um, first off, the money that is actually being printed or the new currency that's being generated digitally or otherwise, that money goes into bank vaults to provide extra capital for loans to mainly businesses but also people. But this constant excess of uh, debt that's available and capital that's available um, basically makes it so that businesses have like an endless piggy bank of debt that they can, that they can pull from. And they also use that debt to fund mergers and acquisitions and accelerate the rate at which a handful of companies gain control over the entire marketplace. And that is itself a distortion. And that's why 50 years ago, we were, um, in 1970, we were the land of small businesses and now we are the land of giant corporations. <clears throat> the other way in which inflation um, negatively affects labor is because it uh, or negatively affects the economy and negatively affects labor is because it dilutes wages and salaries as a share of the economy as well as debt and savings but the actual value of the economy does not change so it shrinks labor and wage inputs relative to the overall uh, value of things and thus um, actually grows profits and, and tilts things in favor of capitalists and against laborers. Um, so inflation does, so inflation hurts American labor in, in those two fundamental ways. It creates the excess capital and it also dilutes wages and salaries directly. Uh, because we have uh, wages and salaries that are based off of the dollar, not based off of a concrete value. Um, and we could fix this issue 
not not the um, where the money is going. We could change it so that it just goes out to uh, people so that they can consume it. It just goes to the people. But I actually think that the going to the banks for certain reasons is the, is fine and it should be left loan and that's the way we should go. But on the other side, um, all wages and salaries should be corrected for um, inflation every single year or quarterly so that the American consumption market and the American um, wages and, and uh, salary values do not constantly get diminished. So you get the benefits of inflation, the benefits of this alternative system without the drawbacks of wages and salaries being constantly devalued. So, um, then we also have immigration. So I talked about labor scarcity earlier. Um, immigration is always talked about as if it's a one sort of one size fits all category. All immigrants are the same. And obviously they're not. First off, if you came here illegally versus legally, that is an issue. Um, it's a topic for another day, but that is an issue. It shouldn't be illegal. But even separate from that, then you have legal and illegal immigrants that do and do not commit crimes. And then within the criminal faction of that, you have some that are violent criminals and some that are non-violent criminals. So it's a very complex topic. But immigration as a whole, I will, I will tackle another day. But for... Uh, the sake of this discussion, we're just going to talk about immigrants in the economic sense. And many of my libertarian friends and other pro-immigrant friends will say that immigrants can create jobs, which is true, but it takes time. And what I'm about to say in terms of economic analysis of immigration has nothing to do with that cr job creation rate, because at any given one time, we have a fixed number of jobs. And at any given one month or year or quarter, we have a fixed job creation rate. So no matter what, jobs are a fixed commodity. Labor, however, is not. So immigration is the importing of labor because the supply of labor is people. So if you bring in more people, you have more labor, then you increase the supply of labor. Now, if you have uh, legal immigration, that's increasing the supply of labor at a certain rate, and that rate has massively accelerated since the 70s. But then if you have illegal immigration, it's completely uncontrolled, and so you buy, you almost are guaranteed to have too much, uh, imp too much labor importing into your country. So, uh, we need to control illegal immigration and end it, and we're on our way to doing, to uh, being able to do that. But we also need to calibrate our legal immigration rate to the two only fill in the job the extra jobs that we have so I talked about labor scarcity where we have more available jobs than than active people looking for work well once you have that scenario then you can actually bring people in through immigration and it does not dilute wages at all because it's not not allowing the supply to exceed the demand but if you have a situation where you have a recession or a massive job loss so there's a massive decrease in the demand for labor to continue to add supply to the to uh, the labor pool during that period will only prolong your economic recovery and your, your decreasing unemployment rate. That's part of the reason why um, the recovery was so slow under the Obama years was because illegal immigration was, legal and illegal immigration was supplanting that decrease in the unemployment rate that would have, that would have come much faster otherwise. So, um, we, create jobs. So prior to this recession, we were creating jobs at about 250,000 a month. And we are increasing our own uh, domestic labor supply by about 100,000 a month. So we had a gap of about 150,000 a month. And if you did not fill those with immigrants, then those would just go unfulfilled. We wouldn't have that tax base. We wouldn't have those additional consumer dollars. The economy wouldn't grow as fast. So as long as we maintain labor scarcity, as many immigrants as we can bring in as possible, that's awesome. We just have to maintain labor scarcity so that labor is not at a at a macroeconomic disadvantage relative to capital. Trade. So trade is the other side of that. You have the supply. Now you have the demand. So trade is uh, production, which is the demand for labor and for jobs. By allowing uh, production since the seventh since 1970. Uh, oh, so. 1945 to 1970, no trade deficits. 1970 onward, started taking trade deficits. 
And in this period from 1945 to 1970, we had GDP growth rates of 8%, 12%, 16%, crazy high rates, check it out. As soon as we started taking trade deficits, that immediately dropped, like the two charts are identical, that immediately dropped to like three, 4% if we're lucky, usually like two to 4%. So what they started doing in 1970 was spreading production or the demand for labor out as they try to spread it across as many labor pools as possible to dilute the, the demand for labor as much as possible to keep labor scarcity from occurring in as many countries as possible to keep wages and everyday people from getting richer faster. Um, also, on the domestic front, having an intentionally bad or anti-economically competitive tax code is another way to hurt American labor. If it costs more to invest in America because of a bad tax code, it costs more to do business in America because of, of a past, because of a bad tax code, and it costs more to hire people and pay people because of a bad tax code, then all the global investment is going to go elsewhere and not come into our country. So a bad tax code in and of itself screws the American people. Um, excessive cost of compliance, so regulations. Um, I'll talk about regulations here. Um, regulations are simply inserting a base level of quality in the marketplace. So they all goods and services vary along quality and price within the marketplace. And what regulations do is they insert a base level of quality, as an example, to say, at this restaurant you cannot sell tainted meat. Ergo, this base level of quality, non-tainted meat, comes with a certain base level of cost that's also added by having that regulation. So there's cost of compliance um, that's always going to be there within regulations. And you, you have to analyze regulations single, like case by case, in order to, to um, get, have the appropriate regulatory sort of policy. Um, but if you have regulations that make businesses deviate from their most economical uh, way of doing business and it does so and you do that with the regulations um, more so than is necessary that difference between what is absolutely necessary and what is actually happening that gap is the unnecessary cost of compliance and unnecessary costs of compliance hurt the economy and hurt the American laborer and then any direct tax on labor um, such as the payroll tax, and I'll explain that in a minute, also hurts American competitiveness. Now, many mainstream economists, neoliberal and center-right conservative, as well as many political pundits, such as Ben Shapiro, will argue that by having the cheapest possible inputs of labor um, across the board, you create the cheapest products possible, you make consumption as efficient as possible, and thus you uh, create maximum efficiency in the system and the system is, is as good off as it's going to be and um, by increasing profits as much as possible you increase the total amount of investment out there in the world and that will also grow the economy as fast as possible. Both of these uh, premises are faulty. The capital one is faulty because most rich people that make lots of money uh, in the world that we have now where there's a constant excess of supply of debt in banks because that we print money and that's where we put it <clears throat> um, there's a constant supply of capital. There's no shortage of capital that can be financed via debt. So um, they don't actually put their capital out there in the world as much or as often. They'll often try to take loans out instead, and they'll just hang out and hang on to their money until there's a recession, buy into some stocks, and then blow it up. Or, or buy into stocks, ride the wave, and then exit, and then maintain your bajillions for the next few years. Um, and on the other side of that, the fact that it uh, makes consumption efficient, when you make consumption as efficient as possible, and so you take labor value out of certain countries to a massive degree, what you're doing, <clears throat> what you're doing is you're actually destroying the domestic consumer market because so many individuals can't actually buy anything. And when you collapse the, co the local consumer market, you don't have as much consumption fueling the entire system and the system falls apart. That's what started happening in after 1970 when we started taking trade deficits. That along with going off of the gold standard and along with uh, some other policies 
led to the crazy high inflation of the 70s and the slow economy of the 1970s. And so to supplant that lost labor value in the 1970s, the great society programs were rolled out so that the people that had no income whatsoever would get just enough to make sure they can survive and keep consuming and keep fueling the machine to grow the global economy as much as possible. Um, and so welfare does have that effect. It does have that effect of um, adding artificial consumption into the system and thus growing the system artificially fast. So that's when you think about the enhanced unemployment, when you think about the um, PPP loans and you think about the stimulus, all of that that's not the uh, business sort of cost of operations PPP loan stuff, the rest of it is all adding consumption to the market to help grow the economy and bring it back as fast as possible.